if you want 100% consistency and 100% network failure partitioning tolerance, you can't have 100% availability. You always have to make that sacrifice. You know, we're talking about relational databases as well as like schemaless, NoSQL type of databases. Actually, uh, relational databases are more like CP systems. They have higher consistency. They are more tolerant to partitioning. On the other hand, NoSQL databases are compromising from consistency. They're eventually consistent, but they provide higher availability. So they're AP systems. So if you have this like mental model, I think databases are becoming easier to understand because there's a limit. There's like physical limits <laughs> to the world and you can't have it all. Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode cloud servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Linode makes cloud computing simple, affordable, and accessible. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing your enterprise's infrastructure, Linode has the pricing, support, and scale you need to take your ideas to the next level. We trust Linode because they keep it fast and they keep it simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from around the Go community. Next week on the show, Yana, Matt, and John are back at it again. This time, they take up a listener request and discuss reflection and metaprogramming. Stay tuned for that. Right now, we're all about that database. Let's do this. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Go Time. I'm Matt Raya. Today we're talking about databases. I'm joined by John Calhoun. Hello, John. Hey, Matt. How's it going? Pretty good. Have you ever used a database? A couple times. Oh, cool. Uh, well, we are very lucky to have an expert, I would say, in this field, uh, which is is going to be very helpful for this show. It's Yana B. Dogan. Hello, Yana. Hello, how are you? I wouldn't say that I'm an expert, by the way. Um, I was, mm. I'm more of like a frustrated user <laughs> who decided to work on databases as a revenge type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, it's such a massive subject. Maybe we could start with some of the basics. Like what are the main types of database that developers can choose? Databases is a very large spectrum. If you think about like the way we categorize things, there are a few dimensions. Uh, for example, one of the dimensions is we have like relational databases and then we have like schemaless databases. On the other hand, um, we have like all these niche databases such as uh, document DBs, graph DBs. It's more of like the data model you have and like the way you access to that data model. It's such a even like a wide spectrum to talk about like how we categorize databases. And I think like partially today, we will be talking a lot about how difficult it is to pick, how difficult it is to kind of like verify that that's the DB that I, you know, just kind of like fits the problem space and so on. So even, even you know, from a very high level overview, databases are hard, hard to categorize and hard to pick. I'd even say, especially now that, I forget the name of it, but there's a couple companies that essentially offer products that are like Google Spreadsheets as your database. Like, so, you know, somebody who's not <laughs> technical can go in and view stuff, but you can sort of use it as a database and it's slower, but it's like a new way of looking at it. And even that, like, you might use it for certain things like, you know, storing stuff about customers, but it doesn't fit into any of the traditional database roles in the sense that it's not, like, performant in any of the good ways that you'd want for a real, you know, like a high-load database. Yeah, but for small cases. Definitely. Um, anything that, you know, in any engine that you can store data, not even an engine, like any place that you can store data, you know, can be named as a database. I'm seeing sometimes, like, blob storage sort of engines are also being called as a database because you can index things interestingly. You can still, you know, query things. There are like column-based storage, blob storage, you know, infrastructure and so on. Some people call them databases. It's hard to tell like what is a database and what is not. 
I used to think that like I need to, you know, just kind of like go back and work on stateful workflows. And that's how I've, you know, found myself in databases because, you know, everything just kind of like fits into the stateful workload. It's kind of like has a really huge, you know, dependency on any, the, the databases. Very interesting. So, yeah, I know that I've used extensively, I used to just use relational databases. So, that, that you know, for people who aren't familiar, you have tables like spreadsheets. And if you want to reference data across tables, you use like a foreign key. So you point to uh, the primary key in another table. And then later at query time, you can join that data together. Uh, but at scale, that gets a little bit difficult to do because that data is physically sometimes uh, spread around, isn't it? And is that where schemaless databases kind of came from? Yeah, absolutely. The way the database works or the way it models things has a lot of things in common with the storage engine. So the way you store, the way you shard, the way you, you know, really partition the data has a lot to do with the type of like capabilities it provides to query. So from a you know high level perspective, it's always important, I think, for a user to understand how at the like some sort of like a lower layer things are stored. So you can like estimate what is feasible, what kind of like use cases are actually like, good fit for that type of database. Even though it sounds like a bit of work, I really like suggest people to take a look at like, you know, what type of like usage use cases make sense. And in the end of the day, like at the storage level, what do they do before evaluating anything? Yeah, it's interesting because when you have small data, you can kind of get away with anything. I mean, you'd be able to, if you don't have loads of data, any database is probably going to be fine. You could even, in some cases, like you say, use blob stores or things in different ways. When we built like a Gopher Eyes Me website, all the artwork is essentially just files in the blob store. And then there's a process that reads them, just lists them, and then it just saves like a, I think it was a, a, a JSON blob or something that it would then load into memory very quickly. That's because it's kind of tiny data. You can get away with that. As soon as you start hitting scale, though, things get a little bit more interesting, don't they? Yeah, especially um, if you want to run interesting queries, like, you know, the example you gave with relational databases, you want to join like multiple tables. Some of them might be on one particular machine. Some data might be on a different machine and the engine should bring all this together, do the right filtering and whatever, and then join everything and then serve it to the user. I think. From the perspective of if there's one node, or for example, in a system, in a database where you only have one node, everything is just pretty simple. As soon as like you start distributing it, it's becoming complicated. Even in one node, you know, you have like difficulties with different partitioning schemes and so on. So it's making a lot of like giving you a huge advantage to learn how the storage really works. It really gives you a lot of like understanding of what, what is feasible and like what are some of the capabilities and like uh, what type of like, you know, data or like schema makes sense in particular use cases. So I guess related to this, Matt, you talked about scale a couple of times and like going up to scale and different size of databases. One of the things that's interesting to me about that is that I guess the question would more be, do you think databases would have evolved the way they have if we had the hardware we have now when they sort of needed to start evolving? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think there's one more thing that we should consider. The world was not disconnected. So I think in the last 10 years, people are really are looking for faster results. They're like looking for like more complicated queries. We, we just realized that this is a trend at Google, especially, um, you know, in the beginning, I think most of our systems were much, much simpler. And over time, you know, people's tolerance to latency is going low at the same time. Applications want to like provide like more interesting stuff. So they have to run more complicated queries, like join more stuff together. And especially with like, you know, think about the social network, like there's all these like different data models and different databases you need because the data is becoming way too connected. And like you have your friends and friends of friends type of like, you know, different schemas and like connections and filtering requirements and so on. So Everything is becoming more complicated. 
And at the same time, our networking, for example, uh, is getting better. Our computing power is getting cheaper. So there are definitely different trade-offs nowadays. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, when I think about uh, the, the different types of data stores that I'm familiar with, basically, broadly speaking, schemaless data stores like MongoDB or Cloud Firestore or versus the relational databases, in a way, if you know exactly what data you want, it's kind of easier in schemaless data stores, you kind of pre-prepare the data in the sense that you often denormalize that data by essentially instead of joining data at query time, when you write the fields, you do the work to get the gather the data together that you need for read. And so a simple example is if you have a person with addresses and, you know, in a, in a relational database, that would be they have a person table and an address table, and they would be some foreign key that linked them together. And then at query time, you can get all of the addresses for a person. And if you then create an order, it's another reference to the address and things like this. In a denormalized world, that would be, you would actually copy probably the address into the order so that you don't have to go and find where that address is in order to have then the complete picture of that order. But of course, there, that is a trade-off because now if that address gets updated or something changes, maybe you update your phone number on that, you then would have to actively go and find all the places where you've copied that data and update it um, or do some other something in the application to kind of get around that. And I find that with rapid development and this kind of iter very fast iterative development, relational databases in some ways are quite a lot easier because you can cut data in different and unexpected ways after the fact. When you do with schemaless data, especially if you really want those reads to be rapid, you can't really do that as much. You have to have written it in the right way in the first place. And so I find that to be sometimes a little bit more difficult. I think we had this conversation before at GoTime. We were talking about like how it's easier to iterate on the schema uh, without a schemaless, you know, setting. And then like once you are sort of like ready, some of the, you know, the organizations are actually taking it and translating it to more of like relational and like, you know, schema uh, based uh, type of like models that's common but it's also sometimes very difficult because you're taking a database with a completely different set of like trade-offs plus performance characteristics and like trying to represent the data in a completely different way in a new db if you don't have experience with you know the db you're migrating to and especially if you're like a slightly larger more successful project uh, things are getting harder but the, we see this shift very too often but on the other hand, you know, with some applications where, you know, financial ex applications, for example, they care really about consistency. They really want like their transactions and like they really want their foreign keys. So they understand that it's difficult. Iteration will take a while, but they start with the, you know, relational databases because they know like that's the way to go. Yeah, I've seen that before as well, where you start with one type of database and then there's a particular problem that it doesn't do very well at. And so then you introduce a different kind of database and have them both. That, I think, is probably more likely than we sometimes build these abstractions imagining that we can switch out our database. You're probably never going to do that. But having different types of databases and representing data in different ways, it, kind of an optimization really after the fact, once you understand more about what you need or where your bottlenecks are. The classic example of that that I've heard is that I've been told that at Stripe, one of the common things they've done is that they have a NoSQL database that they're using for all the, you know, really high speed transactions. Mm -hmm. But then on the back end, when they want to run analytics and do all these other things, it's really hard to do that. And a lot of times people want SQL, you know, they want to be able to use some tools that use SQL for that. So they actually take a lot of that data and translate it into a SQL database. And while it's delayed, it's only used internally, so that's okay. So like they're taking that trade off and deciding it's useful to have this data in both formats. And, you know, it's like you said, they didn't switch from one to the other. It's more of a, this makes sense for this use case and we port it over to this for another use case. Yeah, in my experience, I'm seeing always like two or three databases, you know, in a system like um, you can't really fight the trade-offs, you know, you get benefit 
from them differently. There's usually a relational database, another database for warehousing reasons, like analytics and so on. And then there's usually a database like or something like Elastic uh, for, you know, for search reasons. So, you know, you can at least like list three core data resources. Yeah, and then of course backup could even be a different one where you, you're taking taking backup and putting it in some kind of cold storage or just less active place. It's common, I think, for developers to want to get the perfect solution from the beginning and just build that. But probably a better strategy is to just start with something, one thing, simple, do what you're going to do with it. And then as it starts to become a problem, hopefully you are keeping an eye on it, then you can start to think about these things and see if there's perhaps a different technology that that would work. Yeah, I've seen a trend of people are starting from the database they know. Hmm. For example, you know, we're talking about a lot of like limitations around MySQL. But if you consider like the number of people who are using MySQL, it's there's, you know, it's kind of like contradicting, right? But each time I talk to people who are very large users of MySQL, their number one argument is this. Database is a huge world. We really know MySQL. That's like a really safe bet because we know how it scales, how it fails. Even though there are difficulties or even though we will have to do some more work ourselves, at least we know what to do. And then they pivot from there. Uh, that's a really common thing. Like, you know, you started MySQL for your relational da- database and then kind of like start evaluating things over time. Probably that's not going to cover whatever you need from a database. Yeah, yeah. I think also if there's a technology that you prefer as well uh, in the early stages of a project, that goes quite a long way if you enjoy that sort of technology. I'm building a project at the moment using a Cloud Firestore, uh, which is a schemaless database, and it's extremely fast. The reads are extremely quick, but the, it's quite limited in what you can do, and you certainly can't join data in the way that you would with MySQL. In fact, if you want to even query or filter on multiple fields, you have to actively create an index for that. And so that is quite a change to if you've only used relational databases in the past, that's quite a strange thing to then be faced with. And since you don't do joins in it, it means you get quite good at denormalizing and then, you know, working around the trade-offs that come with that denormalization. It is very interesting. And and in that case, with that technology, the limits actually really uh, force you to understand the the underlying technology and how it works. And that means I feel like we are making better decisions. It's not just a case of the data is just there and I can get whatever data I like. We really have to think about how do we want to read this data? How are we going to present it even like to the users? What do they care about? You really have to think about that at right time versus, you know, being able to just do whatever you want later. Yeah, even, and, you know, you adopt new databases if your requirements change, right? Like you're iterating on your product and at some point you realize that, like, you actually need this type of, like, query and, like, this is your latency, you know, requirements and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you just bring in another database, you duplicate some data, um, but, you know, that's how it works. Yeah, and that is what we've done. We actually have BigQuery as well um, Mm -hmm. as part of this too. And there's also, there's other uh, database technologies. And another one is uh, Spanner, which is the the Google product. And Yana, you work on Spanner, don't you? Yeah, so I actually switched to the Spanner team almost a month ago, or maybe it's been more than a month. It's going really, time is flying to me nowadays. (laughs) One reason I actually want to work on Spanner is I want to go back to databases. Before coming to Google, um, I was mainly working on databases. And the reason I came to Google is actually like I was table flipping every day uh, because we were losing data or we had like performance problems and so on. And I just wanted to go to a company where databases are sorted out so I can delegate my state work to, you know, state problems to something else. And I can like focus on my app, my business logic, like my higher level Mm. stuff. And it's funny now because, you know, I came to this company not to work on databases, but I eventually ended up working on databases. 
And um, we were talking about, I was talking about the Spanner team a couple of months ago, maybe around like February. Like, I was like wondering, hey, what's going on? You know, mm. I used to think that like Spanner is, has a very different approach to some of the problems we're discussing right here. And I was wondering, you know, what's going on with their, uh, they have a cloud product also, uh, what is, you know, usage and so on. I thought that it's, it's a, you know, it's a huge missed opportunity that, you know, nobody's actually talking about Spanner. Nobody's like actually filling the gaps for Spanner because its approach, which I can explain briefly what it does, is very different. And it's mm. a really interesting mental exercise for me to go back to databases because it's on the other side of the spectrum. And from that perspective, I learn more about the traditional databases because I, you know, constantly am comparing the design decisions and like different fail modes and so on. Yeah. You know, when you say table flipping, that's not a database term, is it? You mean you were getting frustrated and turning tables over, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> table flipping sounds like that could be a thing in databases, doesn't it? <laughs> It is going to be my new tool if I ever build a tool like some yeah. table, like whatever. Yeah, table flip. Yeah, I'm going to go cool. tell people. Yeah. Just waiting yeah. for data to get thrown all over the place, just in random spots. <laughs> yeah. We deserve a better internet and the Brave team has the recipe for bringing it to us. Start with Google Chrome, keep the extension, the dev tools, and the rendering engine that make Chrome great. Rip out the Google bits, we don't need them. Mix in ad and tracker blocking by default, quick access to the Tor network for true private browsing, and an opt-in reward system so you can get paid to view privacy respecting ads. Then turn around and use those rewards to support your favorite web creators like us. Download Brave today using the link in the show notes and give tipping a try on changelog.com. I remember when Spanner was kind of first announced and it did get quite a lot of press. It seemed like it was doing the impossible. What does it do differently and uh, what problem does it address? We've been uh, talking about a lot of trade-offs, and but we've never mentioned the cap theorem. Mm -hmm. Eric Brewer a while ago came up with this idea that like if we, there are like three things you can have, um, that, you know, in distributed uh, systems, you can't have three of these things you have to pick two and those three things are represented by cap which is cap uh, cap means consistency sorry a means availability uh, p means partition tolerance uh, like you know network partitioning tolerance and what he says is if you want a hundred percent consistency and a hundred percent network failure partitioning tolerance you can't have a hundred percent availability. You always have to have make that sacrifice. You know, we're talking about relational databases as well as like schemaless, NoSQL type of databases. Actually, uh, relational databases are more like CP systems. They have higher consistency. They are more tolerant to partitioning. On the other hand, uh, NoSQL databases are, you know, compromising from consistency. They're eventually consistent but they provide higher availability. So they're AP systems. So if you have this like mental model, I think databases are becoming easier to understand because you know that like you, there's a limit, like there's like physical limits <laughs> to the world and you can't have it all. <laughs> I've worked for some project managers that really just don't agree with this. <laughs> they want all three. Yes, because you know, it's just hard to explain. It's almost like if you don't know about the fundamentals of the limitations, right, about distributed systems, it's hard to convince people, even mm. if you are bringing all these papers and like concepts and whatever. Yeah, it is counterintuitive. Um, you've mentioned eventual consistency. Uh, developers should be familiar with this concept because it is quite important, especially when you're working with data at scale. And essentially, it's the idea that if you're going to make put some data into the database, if you've got that data spread across physical locations, which you might do for some sensible reasons, it's going to take some time for those changes to propagate. And it does seem counterintuitive to people because you think, well, I've put this in the database and then I did a query and that result didn't show up. And if you think about the user experience of that, 
it is quite bad. Like you, the users just created something, then they go back to look for it and it's not there. And that's just because maybe they hit a different node when they did the query or you're waiting for the indexes to update or whatever it is. How do we solve that? Let me ask that question. How do we solve problems like that? I think there are some approaches and like it, it kind of depends on what you're doing, but there are approaches depending on the problem. Like, mm -hmm. let's say you've got this really popular website with comments for some reason and you need to go to a NoSQL database. Well, when a user posts a comment, you could basically say, OK, this user needs to read from the spot where it was written to, you know, from like we need to make sure that syncs up so the user sees their own comment, you know, right. so they have that sort of like consistency in their head. But for other users who are browsing that website, if it takes a couple seconds or a minute for that comment to show up, really doesn't matter to them because they don't really know any better. So it's one of those things where you can take sort of trade-offs like that where as long as the user who posted it gets that, you know, real-time feeling, the rest of the users can kind of have the, you know, don't see it for a minute type approach. But it really just depends on what you're doing. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the feeling because I've got around this problem in the past by in the browser just basically caching the comment. So it's gone to the API immediately and puts it into the DOM. So it feels very snappy. It's done it immediately. But in the background, it's still waiting for that request to finish. And it is kind of smoke and mirrors sometimes, isn't it? It is. And what you said was so true. Like it really depends on the use case and like users have to go through this gymnastic themselves to pick the right thing. And it has a lot to do again with the cap. Like you can't have three of them. You have to pick two. What Spanner does interestingly is like they claim that they actually are beating the cap theorem, which is something controversial because what Eric Brewer says in theory, it's a model to think about very extremes. So Spanner says that like we have them all, you don't have to make any compromises. But you know, in Eric Brewer's mental model uh, about his theorem is like, if you think about the very extreme case, like 100%, 100% available, 100% consistent, 100% partitioning, that type of extremes that can't exist because of the physical limitations of the world. You know, like you will have some sort of network partitioning, right? Like some, some sort of. And Spanner is actually a typical CP system. It has 100% consistency and is very tolerant to partitioning, but its availability is significantly higher than any other relational database, which is... Uh, it, provides five nines of availability, which means like five minutes downtime a year. You know, that's like amazing. Like most of the relational databases require 10 minutes or whatever a month for maintenance and so on. Or if you want to upgrade the, you know, the, the schema, it requires downtime or the failover it requires downtime. So how did this happen? Like, you know, the, the Spanner team kind of says that they're beating the cap theorem because they provide this like high availability. And it has a lot to do the way how the internals of this distributed system is working, plus our good networking infrastructure. So we're just kind of like, you know, improving the availability, not to 100%. We're still talking about five nines, but five nines is actually a lot in practice. Mm. So, you know, our goal is like, Maybe you shouldn't make as many as compromises. Uh, we will try to, you know, provide you a higher availability, but you will still have the like transactional relational database. But at the same time, we have a lot of limitations around like, you know, the type of the schema limitations, for example, some SQL limitations, because, you know, it's hard to deliver really complicated queries on a very, you know, highly distributed uh, system. And it's still kind of like, you know, latency-wise, for example, the way we handle writes are completely different from traditional databases. But we are trying to like, you know, like pick the best. For example, unlike other traditional databases, when a write comes to Spanner, we go and like write it to uh, multiple replicas. Mm. It arrives at the leader... But we synch synchronously, you know, sync it with other replicas. But we use Paxos voting system. So if a, you know, replica goes down, it doesn't really stop uh, the write. And in traditional databases, they don't have this concept. So it's just kind of like if something goes down, 
that ride fails or like there's going to be huge latency until something comes back up again and so on and so on. So they're trying to like pick up those like different flavors of things because, you know, the world has changed a lot. We have better networking now, like we have better computers We have like specialized hardware and so on. So like they're like, everything is going distributed. We need, you know, larger scale, more resilience. Why not to think about a completely new database in this new world with the new rules and sort of. Now, that's why I like the project because, you know, it just looks things from a different perspective. And then you kind of like are internalizing all the other hard problems in other databases by looking from that perspective. Yeah, that is so cool. It's funny because that's kind of how I see Go as a language as well. You know, it, someone said, someone commented that Go is kind of just like C, but C was designed back when computers had single core and they were not much memory. You know, things were different. And Go is um, uh, was designed for more modern architectures. So it definitely does make sense that you would do that for databases as well. And, you know, Spanner has the same level of opinionation, like it has a opinionated, for example, shard and scheme, hmm. but it works for the people. It works um, and you, you can tweak it. You know, you have to learn how to tweak it, but you know, it just works for a lot of like workloads. We use Spanner at Google for lots of things like there are databases actually built on top of Spanner. We're trying to like migrate everyone uh, to Spanner databases. It just works for a lot of cases. It gives you some sort of opinion, but as a result of that, you don't have to think about like this hard problems of, you know, sharding, auto, you know, failovers. Um, you have this global consistency, which is great because you can start a transaction in one microservice and then you can update the same table on another microservice without like making them collaborate. You don't have to like, you know, acquire any exclusive locks or whatever. Database is just going to handle it will see if they're serializing, if there's any conflict or whatever, it's going to abort. Because, you know, there are different trade-offs and like this database is really designed for distributed systems and with these new rules in the new world, you know, this is what I think a database should look like. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that you're building databases on top of Spanner. I mean, that is quite, that is quite a testament to how good <laughs> Spanner is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, storage systems are always, you know, bootstrapping from each other mm. because, you know, it's just hard to like come up with like something very scratch. For example, Spanner had metadata in Bigtable when it was first bootstrapping and uh, it's using our, you know, earlier storage, blob storage engine and file system Colossus. So they're all like, you know, sort of like depending on each other. And uh, it's funny because I think Colossus nowadays is using Spanner for metadata or something like that. So there's always this like bootstrapping and interdependencies. But that's how we evolve because, you know, you can't build everything from scratch. You have to pick the right things that is available to you. It's almost like, you know, they wrote the compiler in C and then like migrated everything to Go at a later time when everything is just like more, you know, Go is more sufficient enough to mm. support the compiler itself. <laughs> so you, you see all this like, you know, bootstrapping in like common usages and so on in, in storage. Yeah, it's so meta. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that the Cloud Firestore thing does is quite interesting is with IDs. And, you know, IDs is, is kind of another thing that you sort of, in the early days, I took for granted that the database could just create the IDs and often uh, they would just be an incrementing number. You know, so the first entry it goes into the database is one and then the next one is two and so on. I don't have to teach people how to count. <laughs> Are there any problems with that uh, when you're talking about data at scale or in a distributed? So in, in the storage layer, if you are, there are some databases that takes that ID and then, you know, stores thing in the in that order hmm. for example if you have like id1 like two and three will be on in the same partition and so on next to it right yeah and then hmm. that sometimes like creates this like hot spots like for example if your id is for example in twitter's case if you have your id which is something like gradually like auto incrementing you will always have like the same shard that all the recent tweets are coming to, you know, you have to query from. So in order to deal with this, databases use hash functions. So, they, you know, they take the 
key and then like hash things and so on. But some databases, uh, rather than going that, like they're like, okay, like we're not going to, we will tell the user that we're going to use the ID when we're storing things. So they can tweak things maybe. And they uh, suggest you, you know, not to use or the increment because it's going to create all these hotspots and so on and so on. It's again, a design choice. Spanner also doesn't support auto incrementing. We're actually doing some work around to support it, but Spanner's sharding mechanism has a lot to do with the primary key. Primary key is very important in Spanner. And uh, we're trying to like actually like now build things on top of that to make sure that we are not creating those hotspots. Yeah, that is really interesting. So what we're doing is uh, actually random IDs and having an element of randomness to it, which when you <laughs> kind of think about it, is it does seem crazy, I think, when you think we're going to just create a random ID. And then, you, of course, you have to think, well, what happens if on that tiny chance, is it possible that you could have two of these random IDs created at the same time? And, and it is technically possible, right? But just within the laws of physics, it's so unlikely. Is that it? But it's, uh, it's still possible to reject the insert, right? Let's say that, okay, you picked, let's say, eight bits of some random generator, not like a, a long, you know, auto generated ID. And there's a lot of like collisions. Then you can actually like retry by generating another ID in the app level and then insert with that number. Um, so it's very important for the database to have some constraints. In Spanner, we still have the constraints. Like, you know, primary key cannot be duplicated. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be unique. So it provides those type of constraints, which helps, you know, the application level a lot. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because, you know, I think understanding the database uh, often does drive changes in the design of the application like you talk about. But what happens in that case, though, if, say, two IDs just happen to create the same ID, if it's an eventually consistent thing, wouldn't they both feel like they've created the record? When, at what point do they find out that that's failed? This is why you need transactions in databases. There's this concept called transactions. And transactions have some properties in relational databases. This is summarized by ACID. Um, ACID means atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. It means that, you know, whatever you commit needs to be consistent at the end. You shouldn't have like two IDs at the same time and whatever. So the database, if there's something conflicting going on, can reject uh, the second, in, you know, insert if you generated a duplicate key. And then you, at the application level, can write logic to you know, retry, retry with a newly generated thing. So you will have like, you know, consistency all across without you know, eventually waiting for things to happen because you know, you can, your transaction is going to be aborted by the time you are trying to commit because you generated a duplicate key. Even if you didn't have the transactions, I imagine you could come up with some sort of strategy, but it just might be a little different. Yeah. Like one example is if you have like five servers, each one might have a unique ID and they might take your unique identifier and, you know, at the very end, throw their unique ID. So even if it does succeed, you know, each one's going to be separate. You just have to have whichever one you wrote to first tell you, you know, what the actual real ID is at this point. So it puts like the node ID on it mixes it together yeah so something like that so you you know it's unique so even if both worked they're both going to be unique they're just going to both have a you know, different suffix of some sort or something like that the other strategy is to um have a generator so the generator generates and makes sure that you know it's actually unique it kind of like stores the fact that it's actually like generated it's also you know this is like a complicated problem i don't want to talk about all the fail modes but your IDs can come from a trusted source, let's say. Um, you can, you know, provision maybe exclusive locks and whatever. So you can make sure that you can trust the ID. Yeah. I've used a system before. I worked in a place and there was an ID service. And you could say, like, give me 10 IDs. <laughs> and then it would give you them and it guaranteed, that, I guess, that they were unique. Yeah. But it was weird, yeah, as a, someone that was only used to just the database, just incrementing the number or whatever itself, yeah, to then have to do different things and write different behaviors to solve that is, is really an interesting thing. Yeah, and one of the other alternatives is to do optimistic locking. Um, so 
what you can do is like add a version number or something to the record. And you can say like only insert this if the version is one. So you can make sure that like no one has ever written to that record before you. And that also, you know, kind of like gives you this sort of like, um, you can implement that constraint yourself at the application level. Yeah. So if somebody did get in before you, of course, the version number would have changed. And then you know that you notice that it's changed. And then you could either take those changes and reapply yours and then uh, apply them back. Yeah, that is interesting. It's nice when the database does that for you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's why I work for Spanner, like seriously. (laughs) Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to discuss is like, I'm so tired and frustrated about the fact that I need to do what my database is supposed to do. Like all that logic shouldn't be leaking to the application level, but that's sort of what the reality is right now. So I'm just trying to understand like, hey, like what is next, right? Like in databases, how can we make people more productive if it's just giving them like a slightly more open-ended thing that does some of these things, maybe more like, you know, consistency and better, uh, why not, right? I think that's yeah. probably why Rails was so popular. Like it it took that even a step farther and was like, you don't even need to know SQL. You just kind of like have to have an idea of how it works and you can be productive. And I think a lot of people really like that. But there is the downside of, you know, like you said, some things still do leak and you can have really slow queries and things like that as a result. But it, it did try to make that, you know, that leap, which I think is why so many people just felt productive in Rails. everyone. Panelist John Calhoun here. As many of you know, when I'm not recording Go Time episodes, I create programming courses. Some of these are paid and that keeps the lights on at my house, so thank you to anyone who has purchased one of those. But I also offer free courses. One of those free courses is Gopher Sizes. It's a series of 20 Go programming exercises, and in each exercise we build something new or improve upon something we built in a previous exercise. Each exercise is designed to teach you something unique about Go, and they're also a lot of fun. So if you want to check it out, you can do that at gophersizes.com slash go time. That's G-O-P-H-E-R-C-I-S-E-S dot com slash go time. Or you can think of it as gopher plus exercises mashed together into one word because that's where it came from. I realized that um, there was no way for me to like explain what Spanner does. So I wrote that article about things I wish, you know, more developers knew about databases. Mm -hmm. Sort of like give people a catalog of different things that you have to worry about. It's definitely not a full comprehensive list, but it kind of like gives you like, there's a lot to worry about. And you as a random person kind of like discovering those problems along the way as you experience problems like experience data loss and so on and it's such a challenging thing for people who are working in databases because you know they can't explain what the database is good for because nobody understands what you know what is the large list of the problems around so i I find it like equally challenging to be on the other side you know as a person who's working on databases because it's it's so hard to explain the whole spectrum and like, why would anyone care, right? Like that's the database's <laughs> one and only job in the end of the day. But if you give them an opinionated set of things that will make them productive enough, they want to give it a try and you know, they like it. Yeah, you, you know, there's some other kind of design principles and properties of a system, I think, that are important, especially when we're working, like you say, in modern architectures with message queues and databases that have eventual consistency, these kinds of things. One of them that I think is very important that I don't know that loads of developers are familiar with it, but it's idempotency. So operations that are idempotent, essentially, no matter how many times you apply the operation, the end result's the same as just applying it once. So for example, if I were to have a counter and I applied the operation plus one, If I ran that three times, then your number's going to go up three times. That's not idempotent. An idempotent version might be for me to set the number to three. And then if I set to three three times, the end result is the same. It's set to three. Little things like that and designing systems with those 
that sort of knowledge, I think, really helps. And you can kind of design for failure. You know that, yeah, this message system kind of has this at once guarantee, but that means it's possible that it may deliver these the same message multiple times. Well, if that operation is idempotent, for example, that's okay that that happens. So, but it doesn't mean that you can't be useful without knowing that, but of course it does help. Are there any other things that you wish developers knew about when it came to databases? I have a really good book to suggest. Um, Martin Kleppman's book on design and data intensive applications. I think that's the name. It is a really huge comprehensive list of all the things you have to know. Like if you need a catalog or a reference, what are some of the like, you know, the fail modes or like what are some of the like, what is the spectrum of the problems in this particular area? You can take a look at that book. You don't have to read it page by page, but you know, if you need to understand a certain topic, you can just go in like, it, he does a really good categorization plus explaining what is out there, like giving really good references. I really suggest that book to everyone who wants to learn more. Mm. And I will recommend Yana's blog post because it's phenomenal. We'll post it in the show notes. Do you need a fun fact? Yes, please. I think we do. I think we do. <laughs> this is an intense episode. I think a fun fact is just what we need right now. I actually um, was reading Martin Kleppman's book um, maybe like two months ago. And then in my dream, I saw myself writing that blog post. And as soon as I w- woke up, I took notes. Like I think I drafted 10 items on the cover of that book. So that blog post actually like probably came from some of the, you know, the ideas that I got from his book and so on. So that, that's really funny that like, you know, I, I saw that like the article was being very useful in my dream and it turned out to be true. It's so funny. Well, if people didn't feel stupid before, <laughs> the fact that Yana's coming up with this stuff in her sleep is certainly going to do that. That's how Paul McCartney wrote yesterday, by the way. He just woke up and had the song. My dreams that's... are way less productive. Yeah, I just dreamed my legs were made of jelly. That's not helping anyone. <laughs> I can't turn that into a blog post. Probably could. I might. I <laughs> actually am an imposter. Like, all of these good ideas are coming to me when I'm dreaming. I'm serious. Yeah, wow. That's why I'm sleeping. Like, I should just go back to sleep. I don't think that makes you an imposter. <laughs> I think that means you know the stuff so much that it just it does, it can't slow down. That's amazing, though. So in your dream, were you actually like thinking through these? Do you remember the dream at all? Or you just woke up and had the point? Were you trying to solve this in your dream? I remember the dream. I saw that I wrote the article. The article had um, 10 items. And I remember that the first, the, it was something about network partitioning tolerance, which became the first item. There was something about asset. There was something about consistency. There was something about optimistic locking. I think like seven of the items or like at least seven of the items in the actual article came from my dream. And I can send you maybe like the screenshot of the front page so that I'm waking up from the dream, taking notes and then going back to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Great. I love that. Wow. (laughs) If you're going to do a talk and you don't quite have enough, can you just have a quick nap and (laughs) top it up? I sleep when I need to debug. There's one funny thing that like um, I used to see myself as a package in the systems that I designed before coming to Google. Like that was the way for me to, you know, debug my debug the things that I was working on. Then I came to Google and we have distributed tracing, so it became slightly easier. But I remember myself seeing as a message in the rabbit uh, MQ on a topic or something. That that was a you know horror mm. movie. Uh, it was a very overwhelming nightmare, but it really helped me to kind of like internalize some of the mechanics of the things and like the bug. This is a known phenomena, by the way. Lots of people see some of the problems they de- they're dealing with when they are sleeping and then they're like, ah, gotcha, I got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it has happened to me. It is very satisfying. Sometimes, I mean, it's whatever's going on, isn't it, in the sleep when it, the organizing uh, process that when it's putting the memories in and all that stuff is kind of uh, awesome though. That is awesome. Can't believe that. I'm just going to put this up to like something your brains do differently than mine because otherwise I'm going to feel like mine's broken. (laughs) What are you dreaming about? 
probably got some great dreams. I, I've even seen things. Well, but there was like somebody talked about when people think, whether or not they think like thoughts and words in their head, or if it's just something else. And if you're in one like camp or the other, it's really hard to sort of imagine the other because you're like that. I, I don't mm. know how that would work. Yeah, what's what do you mean? Like people think in words, in words, rather than rather than like abstract. something abstract or I don't know. I I don't know because I think I'm more of a words person. Mm. But even then, thinking about how you think is a hard thing to sort of put down. Yeah, it's a bit too meta. Like, yeah, I heard that people don't talk to themselves when they're thinking. Like there are people who only can use visuals or abstractions when they're like thinking about. Any anything like anything random in like their thinking process doesn't have that inner voice, which is very mm. hard for me to relate to because that's such a hard concept for me to have that inner voice with me all the time. Mm. I imagine those people don't talk to themselves because that's usually my inner voice just coming through my lips, and I'm and then somebody look, looks at me and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, don't worry, I'm not crazy, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just saying it out loud. Yeah, sometimes. Oh, right, yeah. Like, if I get really get caught up in whatever I'm thinking about, I have caught myself saying things out loud that I'm sort of thinking in my head, mm. and it, it makes you look really weird at the time. I bet that's got you into some trouble. No. <laughs> Depends what you're thinking. It's always, like, programming. It's never anything that would, like, get me in trouble. Well, it's because you're a nice bloke. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to say it's because those are the things I think hardest about. Like, they require the most thought. Do you ever have that feeling that where you know that an idea is, is about to happen? It hasn't happened yet, but you know that something's going to happen somehow. <laughs> and it can be like a few seconds where you think, oh, hang on, I'm about to have an idea. And then it does happen. <laughs> but it's just a feeling before that. And I can't figure out how that could happen. Do you ever have that? I think I've just had the opposite where I'm like, I had a good idea. And now I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. John, I bet you just can't remember your dreams. You're probably b b solving all kinds of things in there. <laughs> I mean, that could remember. be it. I I'm told that if you like write down and think about your dreams like consistently, that you'll start to remember more of them. But mm. I've never done that. Mm. Oh, it's amazing. Well, it's that time again. It's time for Unpopular Opinions. So, has anybody got an unpopular opinion? To be honest, I haven't practiced for this like particular question, but I can think about one. I have too many unpopular opinions. The only criticism I get is like most of my unpopular opinions are actually popular opinions, but I never <laughs> feel like I can, you know, verbalize them. You haven't found mm. the crowd that agrees with you to hang out with? <laughs> I mean, I can tell you the same thing that I'd said on Twitter earlier, Matt, was that I definitely think that at some point in most developers' careers, they should do debugging through printing out code and walking through it step by step. Now, it, it definitely doesn't work for very large applications or anything crazy, but we had to do this in school for this one uh, programming team I was on. And I found that for like, when you're thinking about something complex, like a, an algorithm or you know something that's a little bit more substance than like just print out foobar or whatever um that by printing it out it forces you to take a step back and instead of being like why is this one test case or in your mind you're thinking it's an edge case the whole thing's right i just got to figure out why this one edge case is wrong but sometimes you need to take a step back and like rethink the entire algorithm or like the, everything that you're sort of basing your assumptions on and when you print it out you don't have the ability to like just change one thing and rerun it because you'll catch yourself doing that with the debugger or something like that you'll just you know, change one line, rerun it real quick. Change another line, rerun it, and be like, all right, why isn't this working? But if you actually have to sit there and, like, trace it with your head, your, you know, with paper, you don't have the opportunity to do that. So you're forced to be like, where, like, could this be wrong? Mm. You know, what what fundamentally might be wrong with this? Yeah, that really resonates. I find just thinking is the best way to debug something. Uh, obviously, that requires you to really kind of hold the whole or at least a good chunk of the system in your brain somehow. And that's obviously the bigger and more complex the system, the more difficult that is. It's another argument for keeping things simple. But 
Yeah, I find that I think some people are more hands-on and they want to go and use a debugger and look at the variables and just watch things changing. And I find that to be quite a difficult thing to do. So I, for me, it's easier to just, I mean, you, you probably just have a siesta, do you, Jana? My opinion on this is, you know, I start with printf debugging all the time because it's more, much easier, convenient, whatever. But if I need to like break at a certain condition, sometimes like things are extraordinarily hard to debug because they happen very rarely. Mm. And if you are really targeting for that particular thing, maybe it makes sense to use a debugger. Right. But it also depends on like how, you know, good uh, the overall workflow is. Like some languages or some platforms have really good debugging experience that makes it somewhat much easier. But in Go, for example, I mean, I always use printf. I am actually very sad that with the new module thing, you know, you need to explicitly override the, the stuff that you're depending on because, you know, it's like sitting in a read-only type of like, there's a, the file modes for the modules are different. Now it's not like, the, you know, you have the Go path and you can change every line, whatever. Mm. I'm a little bit sad because, you know, it's just not a big friction for me, but it's still kind of like, I need to tell my editor to, yes, you can overwrite this type of like, and you see that your text editor is asking whether you want to overwrite, even though there's a file permission or whatever. I like to, in short, uh, to summarize, I really like printf debugging. That's the number one thing. And it helps you to, I think, internalize the source code much better. Just because, you know, you know you're just switching and reading things more. In, in the debug mode, you just only are caring about the execution path. Mm. I should say that I don't hate debug. I think I'm similar to Yana where I don't hate debuggers or any of that. I just think that learning to debug in these other ways, it sort of helps you train your brain to think about the right things. And I think, like Matt, when you said, you know, it's important to sit there and think about the problem, I think that's the reason I, in, in college especially, I think people should be printing out some other code because that's when you're learning to think and learning to, you know, actually be a programmer. And it's a useful tool for that. It's not, it's, I haven't printed out code in like the last 10 years. So it's not like something I'm doing daily or something like that. It's just doing it a few times sort of forced me to actually, you know, avoid those bad habits that otherwise might just leave you floundering and tweaking one line at a time. John, you're talking about literally printing a hard copy of the code. Right? I have printed hard copies of code, mm. yes. So yeah. so what I mean by that is um, a lot of this stemmed from the fact that I did um, ACM... ICPC is what it's called, Intercollegiate Programming Competition. And the way they do it, it's, it's just a program. It's like if you've ever done Google Code Jam or Top Coder or there's different competitions like that. They're mostly algorithm-based and they're like problem-solving. Right. So most solutions are less than 200 lines of code, generally speaking. But the ACM one specifically is for college students and you're on teams of three with one computer. So because of that limitation, anytime you have a bug, your first like thought is supposed to be print out your code and let somebody else do something else because you don't want to hold somebody else up sitting there when you don't even have a clue what's wrong with your stuff. Mm -hmm. So it sort of forced you to, to sit down and be like, all right, where in this code could it be wrong? And you come up with a couple, you know, like, this is what I think is wrong. Here's how I can test it. And then when you're finally ready, you say, okay, I'd, I'd like to be back on the computer if somebody else, you know, is done with whatever they're doing. So... That's where I, I first started doing it. But this was also working with like much more complex algorithms. So it would be like implementing um, min cost, max flow type things that are, you know, a little bit more complex than a bubble sort or something like that. And, and when you're doing that, it's easy to have some bugs in your code. So as a result, it, it's something where you just had to sit and think about it. There was a really good quote from, uh, I think, Ken Thompson or Dennis, Dennis Ritchie. So their approach to debugging is printf debugging and like they were talking about how like reading the code and like looking things from a different perspective actually helps you to debug things and like printf debugging is sort of like helping that process and i kind of am relating to that like i really like to go and like dig in and you know just put some print lines here and there i don't want to necessarily focus only on the execution path because you know, you just want to have like a better sense of the code base in general when you're debugging things and like to see how things fit together and so on. So I, I love printf debugging. Uh, at school, by the way, just because you ask, they ask us uh, to design a debugger. And I created this trampoline thing, which basically takes every symbol, puts a printf before calling the function, 
it just basically rewrites the program to, you know, put a printf and then calls into the actual function. So when you run it in the debug mode, it just like just prints out all the, you know, the co function calls. To me, that approach is like really nice and like is a really good, you know, starting point. Uh, everything that is interactive, I think, is secondary, and it's like more for like those advanced cases where you need to. It's hard to reproduce some of the cases, and you need to evaluate and you know break put breakpoints with some conditions mm. and so on. Yeah, that's it. It's very specific when you're doing that. You're right. You're kind of watching the execution and things, and that might be very appropriate. One of the nice things about just thinking is you can go anywhere very quickly. It's a very fast way of navigating this virtual if you like kind of model of the system um, and you can consider more things more quickly it seems by doing that <laughs> i don't know if i've always done it like that but um my i mean I, I did a tweet about it it's the best tweet i've ever done and i've also it's inspired lots of trolls as well I've, for the first time i've had actual trolls um which is very exciting for me uh, it's like being a woman on twitter <laughs> Uh, one more thing I think about this topic is I was kind of like a bigger fan of debuggers and then I spent like a couple of days like 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago because our debugger had some bugs with concurrency. So like I was never able to like reproduce some of the bugs and I like that was the moment that I actually stopped trusting debuggers. I always do printf because debuggers do all this like crazy rewrites and so on. So you know, I just want minimal impact on my code. I just want to be able to see what's going on first. And then, um, yes, if I couldn't really figure out, I can always like take a look, take another look with the debugger. Yeah, that's actually a great example because when you're stepping through code, you're not running code concurrently like you would normally. And so if you're just thinking, you can actually consider those kinds of more abstract things and more complicated things. It's a quite a good example of a place where you know, yes, it, it might be too narrow in some cases, but it's really whatever works for people. Don't troll me, please. <laughs> well, I think that's all the time we have today. Jana, thank you so much. I really feel like I've learned so much and I'm sure our um, <laughs> listeners have also. Um, so thank you very much. John, I didn't learn anything from you today, mate. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was supposed to troll Jana today. Jared, one of the... Uh, Producers Please. behind Changelog told me that I was supposed to ask what's the best database, and then I was supposed to ask, and why is Postgres the best database? I have some opinions on, even for Postgres, um, but you know, like Postgres is one of those, like, at least it's doing the basics right, and like, it's not like super crazily, like, surprising. It's like actually doing the, like, the bare minimal. Uh, there are some gotchas that you have to learn about every database. Mm. And I think like, yes, I agree with the fact that Postgres is one of the best databases ever. And this is a strong opinion. And like, it's like a outrageous thing to probably say like out loud, but I am a big fan of Postgres. I mean, I'll agree with it because <laughs> it's, it's my go-to tool for most things because it works. It works. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Share your database thoughts and opinions on changelog.com. Tell us which database you think is best of breed and why it's Postgres. Simply click the Discuss on Changelog news link in your show notes or point your web browser of choice to changelog.com slash go time slash 132 and click the Discuss link there. We'd love to hear from you. If go time has helped you be a better gopher, please do tell your friends. Word of mouth is the number one way people hear about podcasts, so we appreciate every shout out, every tweet, every mention on Slack, Reddit, Hacker News, all of it. Sponsoring GoTime is an excellent way to tell your story authentically. It's so effective, in fact, I bet you already know that we're brought to you by Fastly, Linode, and Rollbar. Learn more at changelog.com slash sponsor. We would love to work with you. This episode was hosted by Yana Dogan, Matt Ryer, and John Calhoun. Thanks to Breakmaster Cylinder for the awesome beats. That's all for now. Reflection next week.
this topic really needs like five hours. I can really talk about like five hours and we would be able to still capture like only like 5%. And that's like, you know, my daily challenge right now. Like, how are we supposed to give people an accessible entry point to these problems and what we are doing with these problems and so on? So this was very useful for me because, you know, I got a lot of like opinions from the way that you see things. And that really like helped me to see like your mental model about these problems and so on. Thank you.